fundraising. Indiana Congressman Dan Burton chairs this two-hour business meeting, which took place at the Rayburn House office building on Capitol Hill. Committee will come to order. Would somebody shut that phone off? Is that my phone? No, it's, no, it's not. Okay. Good morning. A quorum being present. The Committee on Government Reform and Oversight will come to order. The committee is assembled today to consider four resolutions directing the House General Counsel to apply to the United States District Court for the District of Columbia for orders immunizing from use in prosecutions the testimony and other information provided to the committee by Irene Wu, Nancy Lee, Larry Wong, and Kent La. We will also consider releasing certain executive session materials. I ask unanimous consent that all members' written statements be included in the record and without objection so ordered. I ask uh, unanimous consent that members be permitted to refer to depositions and interrogatories during today today's debate. Mr. Chairman, I object to that request. And first of all, let me reserve the, the right to object, or I can point out that I think it's improper for members to uh, quote from depositions out of context. If it's from a deposition that's being released in its entirety, I have no difficulty with a member uh, quoting from it, but if it's a deposition that's still being, uh, being held uh, as in, in confidence or outside the public uh, uh, disclosure, then I uh, would object to uh, quotations from those, uh, those documents. Objection has been heard. Mr. Uh, Chairman? Yes. Uh, just a parliamentary inquiry. Uh, isn't it the rule of this committee that we can refer to these things uh, in the course of a hearing in any case? The depositions and interrogatories are for executive session only unless the committee has a vote on them. And if we have a vote on it, of course, uh, then they can be referred to. I see. I th and that is why the chairman asked for unanimous consent, that we could do it by vote if you chose. If we choose to do so, I, I, I think that we probably don't have to do that today, so we won't take the committee's time by asking. I thank the vote. chairman. Mr. Chairman, parliamentary inquiry. Just yes, a follow-up on... Uh, Mr. Cummins. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Just a follow-up on what was just asked. Um, so is it based upon what you just said, does that mean that we will not, therefore, you said you don't think that it will be necessary, does that mean that we will not be entertaining today quotes from the deposition? I just want to be clear because I don't want anything to come out by accident. Just want some clarification. If, if, if the ranking member had not objected, you would have been able to quote from those interrogatories and depositions. But since he has objected and we're not going to have a vote, you will not be able to. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You will not be able to, and no other member will be able to. Mr. Chairman, point Mr. of inquiry. Mr. Kinjorski. Mr. Chairman, uh, I noticed the visual uh, editorial on the far side of the wall there, and I would like to ask two questions. One, is that evidence of a a National Endowment for the Arts uh, grant. And uh, secondly, I, I'm curious as to who's paying for that political editorial. Well, uh, and what uh, the price is. Well, I, I, I think that we'll let you research that, Mr. Kinjorski. Uh, it was not uh, expensive. Uh, and and uh, it's, it's not uh, for uh, comedy purposes either. We'll be glad to, during the course of this uh, discussion and debate today, uh, uh, illuminate that issue for you. Uh, I now recognize myself for as much time as I may consume for my opening statement. Today we are meeting to consider granting immunity to four witnesses. This is a very serious matter. It is a matter that I hope every member has considered very carefully. This committee has faced obstructions that no previous congressional investigation has ever faced. More than 90 people, and I've stated this before and it very rarely appears in the media or in the press, but more than 90 people, many close friends of the president, many former associates of the president, 
have either taken the Fifth Amendment or fled the country to avoid testifying. Taken the Fifth Amendment against self-incrimination against prosecution or fled the country. Fifty-three people involved in raising money for the Democratic National Committee or the Clinton-Gore campaign have taken the fifth. Fifty-three. That means that 53 people that this committee has sought to speak to ha may have committed crimes. That is just an ex astonishing number that everybody in America should stop and think about. These 53 people aren't just rank and file fundraisers. They include senior presidential appointees and personal friends of the president. Webster Hubble has taken the fifth. He reasserted his claim just this week. He was the president's associate attorney general. He received $100,000 from the Riyadi family of Indonesia while he was under investigation. Mark Middleton has taken the fifth. He worked in the office of the chief of staff of the president of the United States. He had num numerous White House meetings with the Riyadis, John Wong, Charlie Tree, and Ning Lap Singh. John Wong, a personal friend of the president, has taken the fifth. He was a deputy assistant secretary of commerce and a major fundraiser at the DNC. The president was personally involved in placing him in both of those positions. 37 witnesses have fled the country. Charlie Tree fled the country for over a year, another personal friend of the president. He returned to the U.S. following his indictment by the Justice Department. He was a presidential appointee to a high-level trade commission. Ted Siong has fled the country, along with 11 members of his family. His daughter, who has remained in the United States, has taken the Fifth Amendment. So have three of his business associates. Today, we will consider immunity for one of his closest associates, Mr. Kent La. The Siong family and their associates have given over $400,000 to the Democrat Party. They have given $150,000 to Republican candidates and groups. We have had an absolute stone wall erected to prevent us from getting to the facts about Ted Siong. Altogether, over 90 people have refused to cooperate. This is unprecedented in the history of this country. There has never been a congressional investigation that has faced this kind of a stone wall. And we have a replica showing some of the problems we have with this stone wall. I have asked my staff to erect the wall that you see on your left so that everyone can see very graphically what kind of obstacles this committee faces in getting at the truth. You can see the pictures, many with the president, of the major figures of this investigation who have fled the country or taken the fifth. The director of the FBI testified here last December. He has had a long and distinguished career in law enforcement. He was a prosecutor, a federal judge, and now the director of the FBI. I asked him when he was before our committee if he had ever seen an investigation in which so many people have taken the fifth or refused to cooperate. He responded, the FBI director responded, that the only time he faced similar obstacles was when he was prosecuting organized crime in New York City. My colleague, Mr. Waxman, likes to complain about the number of subpoenas I have issued. There have been about 600 it would not be necessary to issue so many subpoenas if we had more cooperation from some of the president's friends and appointees who are heading for the hills. We have issued over 100 subpoenas just to get information about Charlie Tree, his associates, and his activities. Over 100 just for that one individual. This was necessary because Charlie Tree had fled the country and gone to China, and most of his associates took the fifth or fled as well. If Mr. Tree had stayed in the country and cooperated with us, these subpoenas would not have been necessary. We have had to issue close to 60 subpoenas to try to get information about Ted Siong because he's fled the country. Most of his family has fled the country. In fact, about 80% of the subpoenas we have issued have been targeted to get information from about a half a dozen key people who have declined to cooperate with us. Charlie Tree, John Wong, Ted Siong, Webster Hubble, Johnny Chung, Mark Middleton, and Jean and Nora Lum, or a combination of these people and their associates. One thing that is very clear to me is that when you have more than 50 people taking the Fifth Amendment against self-incrimination for prosecution, and when you have more than 30 people who are fleeing the country, 
that is a very strong indicator that there was a high level of criminal activity swirling about the president and his campaign. And that fact is inescapable. But the stonewalling doesn't stop there. This committee has faced incredible stonewalling from the White House itself. The White House has been absolutely recalcitrant in turning over documents. We had to go to the brink of holding the White House counsel, Mr. Ruff, in contempt of Congress to get the White House to produce documents. The White House withheld tapes of the president at the White House fundraisers for six months, six months after they were subpoenaed by the Congress. The president has absolutely abused the power of executive privilege to cover up wrongdoing. Six months ago, last September, we attempted to depose Bruce Lindsay, one of the president's closest advisors. We attempted to ask him about his conversations with the president and James Riotti. Mr. Lindsay told us that the president intended to claim executive privilege. When we pressed the issue this spring, the White House relented and admitted that there was no legitimate claim of executive privilege and that Mr. Lindsay would answer the questions. Such frivolous claims of executive privilege should not be made. We have seen executive privilege abused time and time again, and what they're trying to do is buy time to drag this investigation out so far that we'll all get exhausted and quit. Just last month, a White House official, Marcia Scott, got up and walked out of a deposition. She was under subpoena, and she just got up and walked out. We had to call an emergency meeting of the McIntosh subcommittee to compel her to come back and testify. We still have not completed her deposition. She's scheduled to return next week. This is the kind of non-cooperation we have received from almost everybody at that White House. It is very clear that the White House strategy has been all along attack anyone that investigates, stall and delay, and drag out the investigation as long as possible, and then have White House allies in Congress criticize us for the length of the investigation. Drag it out forever, and then blame us because it takes so long. Unfortunately, this is a very cynical game designed to keep the facts and the truth from the American people. That brings us to today's meeting. Today, we will vote to offer immunity to four witnesses. The Justice Department has provided approval to the committee for immunizing all four. We have had numerous meetings with the Justice Department and the minority has been included in these discussions. It's my hope that we will start to lower that stone wall over there a little bit. Let me talk for just a few moments about the witnesses, and then we'll discuss them further during general debate. Kent Law. Kent Law is a close business associate of Ted Siong. He owns the company that distributes Ted Siong's Chinese cigarettes in the United States. He contributed $50,000 to the Democrat National Committee. The few people who know Ted Siong and have been willing to cooperate have all said that Kent Law is beyond a doubt the most knowledgeable person in the country about Siong and his activities. Irene Wu. Irene Wu was Johnny Chung's office manager and top assistant at his company. She arranged his travel and attended numerous fundraising events with him. Numerous witnesses who have been interviewed by this committee have reported that she distributed reimbursements for conduit payments to President Clinton's campaign. Irene Wu has already been immunized by the Justice Department and testified before a grand jury. Nancy Lee. Nancy Lee was also an employee of Johnny Chung. She's also been implicated in soliciting conduit contributions and reimbursing the donors with cash. She's also been given immunity by the Justice Department and testified before a grand jury. Larry Wong. Larry Wong has been a longtime friend of Democratic fundraisers Gene and Nora Lum. The Lums have been a subject of this committee's investigation for quite some time. A number of witnesses have informed the committee that Larry Wong should be very knowledgeable about the Lums' contributions. We have been involved in lengthy consultation with the Justice Department about these witnesses. It's been a very slow process, slower than I think it should have been. In some cases, we have agreed to not pursue immunity for witnesses at the request of the Justice Department. In other cases, we continue to try to work out our disagreements. However, the Justice Department has agreed to immunity for these four witnesses. 
the Justice Department does not oppose us granting immunity to any of these four. Now let me turn to a subject that I know Mr. Waxman is eager to discuss today, the comments that I made about the President over the recess. And I'd like to say just a few things about that. Can I have everybody's attention, please? Dick. Our committee report and any criminal referrals to the Justice Department will be based on facts that this committee gathers through our investigation and not on my personal opinions. Perhaps I could have used different and more diplomatic language to describe how I feel, but the fact is I do not believe that the President of the United States is a man of integrity, and I believe that any objective person who follows the facts would agree with me. Look again at this wall. I call it a wall of shame. Ninety people, many members of the President's administration or close friends of the President, have headed for the hills. All of the President's men and women are running, and those that are willing to come forward are attacked, vilified, and if possible destroyed because they're willing to talk. And the American people ought to be appalled by that. I do believe after this much of our investigation that if we could prove 10% of what we believe to be fact, that this administration and the president would be in serious trouble. And finally on this subject, what I am out to get is the truth, which is very hard to obtain because all of the president's men and women are either fleeing the country or taking the Fifth Amendment against self-incrimination from criminal prosecution. The American people have a right to know the facts, and our committee is determined to get to the facts. And that's what my goal is, and that's what we're going to try to accomplish. Now, let me once again restate this. I personally have some strong feelings, as you can tell, about the president. My feelings are what they are. But as chairman of this committee, I set my personal feelings aside. I base my decisions on the facts. I have always strived to do what is best for the country, and that's what I'm going to continue to do. And whatever report or criminal referrals we send to justice will be based on our investigation and the facts and not my personal opinions. We all have strong feelings about different people. On the floor of the House yesterday, Mr. Waxman called me vile and reprehensible. A few months ago, Mr. Lantos compared one of our witnesses, a highly respected lawyer and an independent counsel investigating the Agriculture Department, he compared him to a Nazi. Democratic Senator Kerry, a Democratic senator in the United States Senate, even described the president as an unusually good liar. That wasn't my party. That was a Democrat senator. An unusually good liar is how he described the president. I would be very surprised if Mr. Waxman or some of his colleagues haven't had private conversations where they called me even worse. My point is that we all have our personal opinions. As we do our jobs here, we all have to put those personal feelings aside and do what we believe is best, and that's what I intend to do. Now let me address the matter of the Hubble tapes. Mr. Waxman has expressed great dismay that we are releasing, releasing to the public tapes made of Mr. Hubble's phone calls while in prison. He has called me vile and reprehensible. Let me tell you what I believe is reprehensible. Webster Hubble was the Associate Attorney General of the United States of America. He was appointed by President Clinton to be one of the highest law enforcement officials of the land. He was a golfing partner and one of the best friends of the President. He's now a convicted felon. He has taken the Fifth Amendment and refused to cooperate with this committee. The American people have an absolute right to know why Webster Hubble received a $100,000 payment from the Riyadi family of Indonesia, the Lippo Group. Americans have an absolute right to know why Mr. Hubble received $700,000 in payments, most of it from friends and associates of the President, at a time that Webb Hubble was under a criminal investigation and believed to be a key witness in matters related to the President and the First Lady. Some people even believe that was hush money. The American people have an absolute right to expect 
that the Associate Attorney General of the United States of America would not stonewall a congressional investigation by taking the Fifth Amendment. Mr. Hubble is a key figure with close ties to the President, the First Lady and figures such as James Riotti and John Wong, as well as other political allies of the White House. He has refused to cooperate with this investigation, and the Independent Counsel's Office has also been reported to be frustrated with his lack of cooperation despite being provided a plea agreement. Now let it be clear, when Mr. Hubble was in jail, he was well aware that his conversations were monitored and taped as is the common practice in prison. In fact, there was a sign up over the phone saying your phone calls are monitored. So what he said on that phone he knew was being monitored. These tapes were obtained legally by the committee and the committee has followed the proper protocols with respect to them. Last week, the working group acted to make the tapes public. Mr. Waxman, or his office, was involved in that process. As we go forward, we are going to limit to the extent possible the release of purely personal information on the prison tapes. We are going to focus the public release of tapes on those which relate to matters bearing on this investigation, such as possible obstruction of investigations, White House pressure on Mr. Hubble or his family, his connection with the Riottis and John Wong, his connections with other political associates of the President, and his 700,000 or more in payments. Committee staff are now editing the transcripts of these tapes that only conversations that are relevant, relevant to this investigation are released. We're not going to release personal conversations between him and his wife that are of a personal nature or his family. Only a limited portion of these prison tapes will end up being made public. The portions that have a bearing on our investigation. This process is still ongoing. So as you can see, all of these hysterics have been for nothing and again designed to deflect attention from the real facts. This is not the first time that hysterical charges have been made. Mr. Waxman accused me of leaking two tapes of Webster Hubble to the press a few weeks ago. The problem is, he did not check the facts. He was wrong. The tapes in question were entered into the committee record during our committee hearings with Attorney General Reno on December 9th under a unanimous consent request by Mr. Shays. And I want to give to Mr. Waxman a copy right now. Here's a copy of the page from the transcript, a copy of it. Mr. Lantos chaired that meeting. Yesterday on the House floor, Mr. Waxman said that we have spent over $6 million on this investigation. Again, he's wrong. He hasn't checked the facts. He isn't even in the ballpark. In fact, this committee spent less than $2.5 million on this investigation last year, and 25% of it was given to Mr. Waxman's staff. I think most of his money was spent on writing letters to me. A lot of these allegations and accusations are meant to distract our attention from the real issue, determining who was responsible for the millions of dollars in foreign money and illegal contributions made during the last campaign. But we will not be distracted. I believe that there are probably some people at the White House and at the DNC who hope that we will not begin to immunize some of these witnesses. I'm sure that there are more than a few people who are not upset at this wall of silence, which I call a wall of shame. But we have a job to do. We must begin to tear down that wall. We have an obligation to get at the truth because the American people have a right to know. We have honorable men and women on both sides of this committee. There's no question about that. It's time to set aside the distractions and the side issues. It's time to start getting the facts out. I hope that my colleagues on both sides of the aisle will support immunity for these witnesses. The Justice Department has no objections, and we shouldn't either. I now yield to the gentleman from California. Mr. Chairman, in listening to your statement, so many mistakes, inventions of facts, untruths. I really don't know what to make of it. I don't even know where to begin. It seems to me your whole thought process is unraveling. 
Yesterday, I criticized your statement, and I said it was vile and reprehensible. I did not say you were vile and reprehensible. I've avoided, I've avoided any personal comments about you. Mr. Chairman, we face two questions today. One is easy and the other is difficult, and for me, genuinely wrenching. Your request for immunity is the easy question. I urge my colleagues to oppose all four requests. When you last requested immunity six months ago, every Democrat on this committee supported you, notwithstanding the fact that the chairman had not given us any voice in this investigation and that voting against immunity was the only vote that Democrats could win since it requires two-thirds vote. As you will remember, because the majority had not properly investigated the witness, that vote turned out to be an embarrassment. Only after he was immunized did we discover that the committee inadvertently gave that witness absolute protection for unrelated and potentially serious immigration and tax violations. In return, the witness provided the committee with testimony that was dem demonstrably inaccurate. After that fiasco, the minority committee members wrote Chairman Burton, and we asked that basic reforms be adopted before proceeding with future immunity requests. On October 22, we wrote to you requesting that the committee procedures be modified to reflect those used in every other congressional investigation. In particular, we ask that in cases where the minority objected to either subpoenas or the chairman's decision to release confidential information, that a committee vote be held. We also ask that new rules be adopted so that candidates for immunity were thoroughly screened and the accuracy of that information that they were going to give us was established. Chairman Burton refused to make these changes, just as he has refused repeated Democratic requests to investigate serious allegations of Republican wrongdoing. The chairman has issued subpoenas to the Democratic National Committee and 14 state Democratic parties. He has not, however, issued a single subpoena to any Republican campaign organization. And I want to ask my staff, if they would, to display a chart that shows how partisan the chairman's approach has been. The chairman has sent 1,037 requests for information to Democratic targets. He has sent only 12 requests for information to Republican targets. In his investigation, it seems Democrats are responsible for 99% of all violations. The only way to conduct such an investigation is to blindly ignore all Republican problems. So the chairman has refused our request to investigate the $50 billion tax break Speaker Gingrich engineered for the tobacco industry in last year's budget bill. Allegations that the Triad Management Services laundered contributions to Kansas Republican candidates and a series of improper Republican fundraising activities and the speaker's relationship with Ted Siong, who is an individual that we are now investigating only in relationship to Democrats. In the last month, the chairman has moved from just being partisan to denying the legitimate rights the minority is guaranteed under the rules. On April 1, he intentionally issued a subpoena without giving notice to the minority and worked with Representative McIntosh to schedule a hearing with only four hours notice. Both actions were blatant and serious violations of the committee's rules. When we raised legitimate points of order at the hearing, we were voted down on a party line basis. Now that meeting had to do with Marcia Scott and the chairman referred to Marcia Scott, who walked out of a deposition. It happened to be her seventh day of depositions. Even a cooperative witness has to at some point say that enough is enough. 
The questions that were asked in the Senate depositions were repeated in the House depositions, and each day she came, she was asked the same questions over and over again. That amounts to harassment, and no witness ought to be subjected to harassment, even if that witness is a Democrat, and even if that witness works for President Clinton, and even though you don't like President Clinton. That's not a basis for harassing an American citizen. Even the most routine courtesies the minority requests, such as scheduling a deposition when our members could be present and participate, are now summarily denied. The chairman has made his views clear, and he has unilateral power and will do whatever he wants. And if that violates the rules, he'll change the rules as he goes along. Today, the chairman seeks immunity requests for four minor figures who apparently know little about any illegal campaign activities. By no stretch of the imagination are they keys to anything. The request here is so that the majority can pretend to be doing real work and then blame the Democrats when we vote against immunity. But there is no point in voting for immunity. This is not a serious investigation. In a series of editorials, the New York Times has called it a, quote, parody of a reputable investigation, end quote. Useless and unprofessional, and a rogue operation. The Washington Post early last year already, already noted that this investigation, quote, runs the risk of becoming its own cartoon a joke and a deserved embarrassment, end quote. The Los Angeles Times called it a partisan sideshow. Even House Republicans called this an investigation an embarrassment. And in one of our Republican committee colleagues was quoted as saying that the incompetence on the committee is frightening. Given this reality, and the chairman's arbitrary refusal to cooperate with the minority, there's no, absolutely no reason this side should help him continue this partisan sham of an investigation. We are accomplishing nothing of value, and this is one instance, the only instance, where the minority has a voice. We should tell the chairman that enough is enough. My Republican colleague, argued that immunity is needed because the Burton investigation has been hampered by people leaving the country, asserting the Fifth Amendment, or refusing to cooperate. Let me address this issue for a moment. It is true that there are some who have not cooperated with this investigation. But it's also true that the Democratic National Committee and the Clinton administration have turned over to the committee nearly every piece of paper demanded by the chairman. In fact, the chairman has now received over 1.5 million pages of information from Democratic sources. In contrast, only 17,280 pages of information has been given to the committee from Republican sources. So I hope my Republican colleagues won't try to take refuge in the excuse that this committee's problem is non-cooperation. This committee's problem is that the majority has committed repeated blunders, that it has squandered over six million taxpayer dollars on a partisan vendetta, and that it has never had a clear focus other than trying to get the president. Your former chief counsel, John Rowley, had it right when he wrote that he was unable to conduct an investigation that it complied with the standards of professional conduct that he had been accustomed to at the United States Attorney's Office. That brings me, Mr. Chairman, to a second very troubling question. As members of Congress, we have a responsibility to hold each other accountable for our actions, especially if one of us is abusing others. It is perhaps the most uncomfortable responsibility we have. Mr. Chairman, I found your remarks last week about President Clinton to be both vile and repugnant, 
and maybe in some ways insightful. I find it distasteful to repeat them, and I regret that I must. As you know, you said, and I'm quoting you, if I could believe 10% of what I believe happened, he'd be gone. This guy is a scumbag. That's why I'm after him. That's what you said about the President of the United States. I want my colleagues to think about that. The Republicans on this committee have given Mr. Burton unilateral powers that no other chairman has ever possessed. Yet here he is calling the President of the United States a scumbag. This is not a street fight. Even if you don't agree with the President on the issues, even if you dislike him personally, he is the President. He was lawfully elected and should not be the target of a, the vendetta that your comments reveal you have. It was interesting to hear your opening statement this morning. You weren't out to get him. You were out to get the truth. But that isn't what you said. You said you were out to get him. And maybe this microphone is not working. Is that, is that an accurate statement? It's okay. From reading your spokesman's comments yesterday, it's clear that you really don't understand this, Mr. Chairman. There are no rationales to justify what you said. You might try to say you said something different but you said what you said. There is always give and take in politics, but you have gone well beyond that and tarnished our work in an unacceptable and inexcusable way. The reason a majority of the American people believe you and others are out to get the president is that you are, and you've admitted so. Nothing else you say can change that fact. I find just as reprehensible the chairman's conduct regarding the Webb Hubble tapes. The chairman and his staff unilaterally, unilaterally released Bureau of Prison recordings of Mr. Hubble and his family and friends in violation of this committee's document protocol and House rules. Articles from these tapes have already appeared in the Wall Street Journal and the American Spectator, a right-wing publication. Nearly all the conversations on these tapes relate to personal discussions that have no bearing on the campaign finance investigation. I will not even characterize the most intimate of these conversations, but I will say that even the less intimate conversations are strikingly personal. Whether it's Mr. Hubble's talks with his daughter about their personal lives or the medical problems that friends may be having, Others, whether it's a conversation with his attorneys or interviews with newspaper reporters on background, things that he and his wife say to each other about mutual friends and the problems they may be having, these are things that are not the business of this committee, and they violate the rules of everybody involved. There's a basic decency involved here in not making public the kinds of intimate conversations a man would have with his wife about things that conversations a man would have with his wife about things that involve them and them alone. On your staff, Mr. Chairman, are some good people. I'm sorry, for instance, that Will Michella is leaving. And while I have disagreements with your chief counsel, Dick Bennett, I acknowledge that he has the right background for this investigation and is an experienced prosecutor. But you have other staff who are simply political operatives. And it's chilling to me that these people, some whose entire work experience has been digging up dirt on the president, could sit night after night 
eavesdropping on the most intimate conversation between a political enemy and his wife. There is a, ver a perverse voyeurism in this, and there's something very wrong when you or your staff leak the conversations without a thought about basic decency. I was puzzled last month when the Wall Street Journal printed its story with a verbatim transcript of Mr. Hubble discussing food with his wife. It seemed such an odd item. Then a colleague reminded me that at this, that time, Mr. Hubble was asserting his Fifth Amendment right as you try to force him to testify in a deposition. It's clear Mr. Hubble might have gotten the message that you were prepared to make life miserable for him unless he cooperated, because he would know, and your staff would know, that his food conversation was just the beginning of the personal material on these recordings. In politics, we often exaggerate the risks to ourselves in justifying decisions so that they look courageous. The truth today, I suppose, is that Democrats run some risk in voting against immunity. We know you and others will inevitably charge that we are blocking your investigation. But it would be unforgivable for us to sit by, Mr. Chairman, while you use your power in an arbitrary, coercive, abusive, and cruel way to punish your enemies, those you and your staff dislike. I don't personally know Mr. Hubble. I've met him. I don't know Miss Scott, I've met her, or Mr. Sullivan, or most of the others involved in this investigation. And I don't, know, I don't have to know them to know that what you're doing is wrong and it must be stopped. It would be unforgivable of us to sit by, Mr. Chairman, when you bring discredit to this committee and to the House by calling the President a scumbag and admitting you're out to get him. I want to ask my colleagues to consider what their and the public's reaction would be if independent counsel Ken Starr, had, who actually has significantly less power than Mr. Burton, had called the President a scumbag, said he was out to get him, and then leaked the Hubble tapes. Mr. Starr would have to resign immediately because it would be clear he lacked the right temperament and judgment for his sensitive job. Mr. Chairman, this isn't the first time you demonstrated that you don't have the temperament for this task. You have suggested on the House floor that the administration might have been involved in the death of a senior administration official. You have wrongly accused the White House on national television of altering tapes, and you show consistent indifference to the serious allegations raised about your own campaign finance conduct as you run this investigation and attack the Justice Department, which is still investigating your own activities. One of the hardest things for me to reconcile is how little your own members seem to know about what you and your staff do in their names. All the power has been delegated to you. You have delegated all to your staff. And we have a process that is accountable to no one and completely divorced from the members of this committee. It is amazing that we could even consider releasing the Hubble tapes and not have any of the members know what is on those tapes. We must do something. The hard decision we face is finding a right remedy. In that search, I think for my part, I have at least concluded that our committee, at least at this point, is not the right place to debate and decide the question. This is a matter properly left for the House floor, and whether it's a motion to censure you or remove you as the head of this investigation or as the chairman of this committee, that's something we'll all have to consider carefully. But you must know and your colleagues must know that something will change. You cannot, as chairman, call the president a scumbag, admit you're out to get him, routinely ignore the rules of this committee, and use your extraordinary powers to punish your enemies and expect us to look the other way. 
I ask my colleagues to oppose this immunity request and join in an appoint finding an appropriate solution to the problem the chairman has presented to us. I now call up uh, four immunity relation resolutions relating to Irene Wu, Nancy Lee, Larry Wong, and Kent Law, and ask unanimous consent that they be considered in block and as read. Without objection, so ordered. Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent that debate on the pending resolutions be limited to 60 minutes. I am uh, reserving the right to object, and I reserve the right to object uh, for the purpose of saying that I don't know how long the debate will go, but I don't think members ought to be precluded from discussing a matter that is important before our committee. Let's don't run over the members again. At least we're in a, when, when we're in a public meeting, members should have the right to debate, make their points, and go on. No one has been accused of being dilatory, and if we found there was dilatory practices, that would be another matter. But let's don't, before we even begin, uh, try to limit the debates so that we can cut off and gag members who want to speak on this issue. So Mr. I do Ch object. Mr. Chairman, I move to close debate on the pending resolutions and all amendments and motions related thereto in 60 minutes, and I move the previous question on the motion to I'm limit point debate. Of order, Mr. Chairman. If there's a motion, then we ought to be able to, to discuss this motion, or, uh, and, uh, and uh, we ought, before the previous question is imposed upon us. Well, the motion has been made. You didn't move. Uh, the, mo the motion what's that? to limit debate is not debatable. Uh, the motion to limit debate is not debatable, according to our parliamentarian. Well, this is just another way you run your committee. Well, Mr. Chairman, no, wait, Chairman, no, wait just a minute. Mr. Chairman, Th this is a rule of the House. The motion to close debate on this is not debatable. Mr. Chairman, parliamentary uh, inquiry. Who is this making the parliamentary inquiry? Over here. Mr. Konjorski. Mr. Chairman, uh, you're, you're attempting to cut off debate, but we're, we're passing on an immunity resolution. As a member of the committee, I request the four proffers of these witnesses so that we understand intelligently That's what not a testimony they're is, apt to give. I is, mean, is that record on the only being held on the minority, that is, that majority is not, side? That is not a parliamentary inquiry, Mr. Konjorski. Uh, asking for a document? That is not a parliamentary inquiry. The Are we going to be denied the proffers, Mr. Chairman? The, the question is on the motion to close debate on the resolutions offered on block. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed signify by saying no. no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The minority, member, minority ranking member asks for a roll call vote and one will be granted. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Burton? Aye. Mr. Burton votes aye. Mr. Gilman? Mr. Hastert? Mr. Hastert votes aye. Mrs. Morella? Mrs. Morella votes aye. Mr. Shays? Mr. Shays votes aye. Mr. Cox? Mr. Cox votes aye. Ms. Ross Layton? Mr. McHugh? Mr. McHugh votes aye. Mr. Horn? Aye. Mr. Horn votes aye. Mr. Micah? Aye. Mr. Micah votes aye. Mr. Davis of Virginia? Aye. Mr. Davis from Virginia votes aye. Mr. McIntosh? Mr. McIntosh votes aye. Mr. Souter? Mr. Souter votes aye. Mr. Scarborough? Mr. Shattuck? Aye. Mr. Shattuck votes aye. Mr. La Tourette? Aye. Mr. La Tourette votes aye. Mr. Sanford? Mr. Sanford votes aye. Mr. Sununu? Aye. Mr. Sununu votes aye. Mr. Sessions? Aye. Mr. Sessions votes aye. Mr. Pappas? Aye. Mr. Pappas votes aye. Mr. Snowbarger? Aye. Mr. Snowbarger votes aye. Mr. Barr? Aye. 
Mr. Barr votes aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. Mr. Miller votes aye. Mr. Waxman? I vote no. Mr. Waxman votes no. Mr. Lantos? Mr. Wise? I vote no. Mr. Wise votes no. Mr. Owens? No. Mr. Owens votes no. Mr. Towns? No. Mr. Towns votes no. Mr. Kandorski? No. Mr. Kandorski votes no. Mr. Condon? Mr. Sanders? Mrs. Maloney? Mrs. Maloney votes no. Mr. Barrett? Mr. Barrett votes no. Ms. Norton? No. Ms. Norton votes no. Mr. Fatah? Mr. Fatah votes no. Mr. Cummings? Mr. Kucinich? Mr. Kucinich votes no. Mr. Bogloyevich? Mr. Bogloyevich votes no. Mr. Davis of Illinois? Mr. Davis of Illinois votes no. Mr. Tierney? Mr. Tierney votes no. Mr. Turner? Mr. Turner votes no. Mr. Allen? Mr. Allen votes no. Mr. Ford? Mr. Gilman? Mr. Gilman? Mr. Gilman votes aye. Ms. Ross Layton? Ms. Ross Layton votes aye. Mr. Scarborough? Mr. Scarborough votes aye. Mr. Lantos? Mr. Condent? Mr. Sanders? Mr. Cummings? No. Mr. Cummings votes no. Mr. Ford? The clerk will report the tally. Mr. Chairman, there are 23 ayes and 16 nays. The motion is carries. Uh, we will now go to opening statements. We will proceed under the five minute rule uh, uh, for the 60 minutes allocated. Uh, I will recognize myself now for five minutes. We're seeking immunity for Kent Law, a close business associate of Ted Siong. The Department of Justice does not object to our immunizing law. Moreover, we have worked out a procedure with the department whereby we will depose Kent Law in a closed session and then allow a department representative to review the transcript before we decide whether or not to call Law to testify in a public hearing. We want to talk to Kent Law about Ted Siong's political contributions and related matters. What's important to keep in mind is that the committee's investigation of Ted Siong is touching upon both contributions made to Democrats and Republicans. Ted Siong and his family and business interests and associates contributed $100,000 to Republican Matt Fong, now running for a U.S. Senate seat in California, $50,000 to the National Policy Forum, which has been connected by the press to the Republican National Committee, $400,000 to the Democrat National Committee and thousands more to Republican and Democrat candidates for state and local offices in California. Our investigation suggests that Kent Law is a personal friend of Ted Siong and that he is perhaps Siong's closest business associate in the United States. Those likely to know the most about Ted Siong, including Siong himself, will not talk to us. Ted Siong and most of his family have fled the country soon after the campaign finance scandal broke. We subpoenaed Ted Siong's daughter, Jessica, Elton Anera, who lives in California and looks after the Siong family businesses in this country, but she's taken the Fifth Amendment. Four other family members and business associates have followed suit. In our judgment, it is likely that Kent Law knows more about Ted Siong than anyone we have thus, spoken, thus far spoken to. Over the course of our investigation, we have asked a number of witnesses whom we should talk to about Ted Siong. The consensus answer has been Kent Law. 
We are pleased that the Justice Department has worked out this <coughs> arrangement, and we believe it's important to move forward to find out how Siong's funds were solicited and donated to both Republicans and Democrats. Johnny Chung and related witnesses. Irene Wu and Nancy Lee were employed by Johnny Chung's company, Automated, uh, automated Intelligence Systems, uh, and they have extensive knowledge of Chung's business and fundraising activities and his contacts with foreign business associates. They received immunity from the Justice Department and testified before a federal grand jury. On March 16, 1998, Johnny Chung pleaded guilty to various charges. He is currently cooperating with the Department of Justice and we're working with the Justice Department to secure Chung's testimony as soon as possible. Irene Wu was Johnny Chung's office manager and primary assistant at AISI. Irene Wu was actively involved in soliciting over $20,000 in conduit contributions for Clinton Gore 96 in connection with an event held in Century City in September of 1995. According to numerous witnesses interviewed by committee investigators, Irene Wu and her ex-husband asked AISI employees and others to enlist the aid of friends and relatives in making those conduit contributions. Irene Wu was immunized by the Justice Department and testified before a federal, federal grand jury. The Justice Department has not objected to the committee immunizing Irene Wu. Nancy Lee. Nancy Lee worked part-time at AISI. She was among the employees asked by Irene Wu to solicit conduit contributions from friends. Lee asked five friends from another company to contribute $1,000 each to Clinton Gore 96 and then reimburse them for their contributions. Like Irene Wu, Nancy Lee was granted immunity by the Department of Justice and testified before a federal grand jury. The Justice Department has not objected to the committee immunizing Nancy Lee. Larry Wong, associate of Gene and Nora Lum. The committee has been examining the fundraising activities of Gene and Nora Lum, who conducted fundraising in 1992 in California for the DNC through APAC, the Asian Pacific American Council. The Lums were associates of John Wong and knew the Riatis. Larry Wong is a close associate of Gene and Nora Lum and worked with them extensively at APAC. Mr. Wong then went, to, went on to become involved with a company that Gene and Nora Lum started up, Dynamic Energy. It was through this company that the Lums made numerous conduit political contributions in 1994. Mr. Wong is believed to have great familiarity with both the 1992 and 1994 activities of the Lums and would be familiar with their contacts and associates involved in fundraising. Mr. Waxman. Chairman, I'll, re I'll reserve my uh, time and uh, for later in the debate. But other Democrats do seek to be recognized. Who seeks to be recognized on the Democrat side? Mr. Kinjorski. Mr. Chairman, earlier I asked... You're recognized for five minutes. I asked the Chairman to provide me with the proffers of the witnesses that we are being asked to immunize. Um, I, I think that uh, all my prior experience in the practice of law would lead me to believe that that is so fundamental a request that I cannot believe this committee or the legal staff of this committee has failed to gain those proffers. So I can only assume that you are denying the minority the right to read those proffers. I think it's only proper that the chairman now state in the record whether or not the majority counsel possesses proffers by these witnesses so that we may understand what value we will derive from the testimony of these witnesses if we offer them immunity. Could I direct a question to the chair as to whether or not you have in fact in your possession proffers from these witnesses and whether or not you're going to make them available to the minority members of this committee? We have a lot of information that we can't discuss in open session. We do not have proffers from the individuals involved. That's why we can't give them to you, number one. But we have other information that leads us to believe that immunity uh, is justified. Do you, do you have, Mr. Chairman, do you have this information in writing? Are you going to share it with us now? Or is some star chamber no. proceeding this is going to be? I, I, I've talked to my general counsel, uh, Mr. Bennett, and we have no problem with you or your counsel discussing uh, the information we have with them. So you, you'll understand. Well, we're now at the process within about 50 minutes of a vote on immunity. I'm taking a portion of my with, five minutes to understand. With, Am I going okay, to well, be... Okay, well, with unanimous consent, I'll have our counsel uh, explain this to you if you'd like. Uh, if the, uh, not on my time, Mr. Chairman. 
Well, whose time would you like uh, for us to use? On the uh, committee's time. I, the, the, the chair should have provided written proffers so that we could well, adequately ascertain whether the information to be derived by these witnesses is reasonable we, in we, terms we, of we, offering immunity. We provided all the background information, as I understand it, to the minority. And uh, I don't know if you've looked at it or not, but uh, that should be sufficient. If it isn't, and you'd like to have a further explanation uh, but, from our legal counsel, but, he's available. If uh, you don't want to use your time, that's with, fine. With, with, with recalling my time. Mr. Chairman, I heard you uh, in your explanation of what's going to happen here is you're going to have some in-camera or ex parte secret hearing to elicit information from the people that are immunized and then determine whether or not their testimony is going to be released publicly. I, I, I wonder under what process now you're making this decision. If you're immunizing a witness, why shouldn't that witness be called in public to testify since nothing they can, is, uh, they can say on the record can ever be used against them at that point? And why should you have editorial power on the release of w whether you want to or not want to release their subsequent immunized testimony? Do you want I me find to that in incredible. Do you yield to I me yield. Or, or to the counsel for an answer? Surely. To our counsel? Would you like for our counsel to respond? If, if you have a simple without a, a multi-paragraph yeah. answer, yes. yes. Congressman Kanjorski, with respect to one witness, the matter of Kent Law, the Justice Department, in discussing this with me and with Ken Ballin, Minority Counsel, has asked that we be very careful to just to have immunity with respect to his testimony in deposition in executive session. Then a representative of the Justice Department would like to review that transcript to determine if they are satisfied with that statement. That's essentially the way to get a proffer under oath. If the Justice Department opposes any further use of that witness, we have agreed. Mr. So, so as I understand, Mr. Barrett, that now we're, we're, not giving, we're not going to vote on absolute immunity, we're going to vote on partial immunity. No, no sir, if I can. With respect to Irene Wu and Nancy Lee, this is all in your briefing no, memo. E even, the, even the individual you talked about. Yes. W once this committee votes a resolution of immunity, I find it difficult to believe that that's limited immunity for a deposition statement. That will constitute immunity once publication is made. Once that deposition is made, anything that witness testifies to, whether it later be released or held in confidence, will constitute immunity. No, sir. It, it relates to what's called use immunity under the Castigar versus United States decision in terms of whether it's used and would thereby taint a criminal prosecution. If I can, it's in a background memo for you, but I think quickly the issue is this. As to Wu and Lee, they have already been immunized by the Department of Justice. Now, Mr. Barrett, I understand what you're saying, but we have now a history of course of conduct here where information received under secrecy agreements and understandings of confidentiality constantly in, appear in publications. It is unreasonable for us to assume that all of a sudden the majority side, whoever takes this uh, in-camera testimony to determine immunity, are not going to breach the relationship and release this, is it the American Spectator that's the now the replacement for the Congressional Record? Uh, I, I'll yield to Mr. Waxman. Well, I thank you for yielding, but the Department of Justice typically does not grant immunity of any kind without a proffer from the would-be witness. Uh, that, that was the rule in the Senate Watergate hearing as well, and it's been the, 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 the rule under which uh, these kinds of matters have been handled. We don't have any proffer in writing. We don't have anything that tells us what, what, what we can expect, for which we're going to give these people immunity from crimes they may have committed. I can't understand why we don't have a proffer, and uh, I'd like to know more information about that. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, we will enter into the record a letter from Justice regarding Mr. Law without objection. Without objection, object. Mr. I object, Mr. Mr. Chairman. You object to having this letter? Well, I want to know what the letter is. I mean, we, we, the, we, we, we understand that you offered unanimous consent to enter something in the record, two tapes that were then released. So I, 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 I've lost my confidence in anything you ask Objection unless we have someone pass Objection it. Objection is heard. It will not be entered in the record. Mr. Mr. Chairman. Cox. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I'd just like to say this document uh, to the chairman signed by Mark M. Richard, acting assistant attorney general, is in everybody's folder, minority and majority, and it lays out quite clearly in accordance with the Castigar, North, and Poindexter decisions that this is an appropriate way to do it, and the full hand has been given to the Department of Justice to review that transcript. And obviously, you can't say anything else in public meeting without tipping that hand. But this has clearly been worked out by justice, the professionals there. And if the game is that justice will release it, knowing that you won't ever offer immunity, that's a pretty sad game. 
This is the Congress of the United States. And when it asks for information, it ought to receive it. And it seems to me when justice signs off on it, and we've got a process like this, this is appropriate. And I would hope the gentleman from Pennsylvania would not stop that letter from going into the record. It's been before you for an hour. Mr. Cox. I seek to be recognized for five minutes. Uh, but I would, uh, before taking my five minutes, offer the gentleman uh, an opportunity to withdraw his objection if he believes the document should come into the record. Until the chairman and the majority side uh, convince me that we can rely on the commitments of this committee and we won't wake up tomorrow morning and read them in the uh, newfound congressional record, American Spectator, I have no reason in the world to withdraw my objection. I have no faith Point of order. In, in the judgment of this committee. Point of order. Objection is heard. Point of order. Uh, objection is heard. Gentleman will state his point of order. We've been gagged with a limit on time, and you yielded to Mr. Horn, and then after he said a few minutes' worth of information, the clock went off, and then you recognized Mr. Cox, and the clock went on. I want to know, are we uh, going to be not only gagged on the time we can debate, but shortchanged on, the, on at least the half of the time uh, th that's supposed to be allocated to us? Uh, it was the chair's understanding that we were discussing the objection of Mr. Konjorski. Mr. Konjorski participated in the debate. The clock will start now. Mr. Cox, you're recognized for well, five point minutes. Point of order. Well, how can the, the clock start now? We've already used up three, four, five minutes on the uh, other side. No, we haven't. I take the gentleman, it I have the time. The gentleman Will that time be excluded from the total amount of debate? Mr. Chairman, Cox is recognized for five minutes. Well, Thank, Mr. You. Thank you. Chairman, I made a point of order, and I want you to rule on my point of order. My point of order is that the order would require that each uh, member be given five minutes, and we go back and forth between the Democrat and Republican sides. Uh, and if uh, and I want to know why we are having more time given to the Republicans. So. The, the discussion was between Mr. Konjorski and Mr. Horn. The chair rules that the point of order is out of order. Mr. Cox is recognized for five minutes. Uh, I thank the chairman, and I've, I take it at this point I can proceed unmolested. Uh, what's before us uh, are uh, letters from the Department of Justice. These are letters that uh, the minority has objected to entering into the record that uh, read as follows. Uh, they are addressed to our committee uh, and to its chief counsel. Uh, the first says, Dear Mr. Bennett, I am writing in response to your letter of April 7, 1998, requesting the Department of Justice's position on the granting of immunity to Larry Wong. The Department of Justice has no opposition to the committee granting immunity to Mr. Wong. We appreciate greatly your coordinating us, co coordinating with us on this matter. Uh, signed, Mark M. Richard, uh, Acting Assistant Attorney General of the United States. Uh, this letter came from the United States Department of Justice, the Clinton administration, uh, as did uh, uh, the next letter uh, on Nancy Lee, as did the next letter on Irene Wu, uh, as did the next letter on Kent Lobb. And so we have no objection from the Department of Justice which would be the only uh, uh, way that these people would be prosecuted uh, to granting immunity so that this administration uh, uh, might uh, subject itself to a fair investigation. But what's going on in this committee, uh, I think, was uh, ably put by the ranking member when he said in his opening statement about this investigation, uh, directing his remark to you, Mr. Chairman, what you are doing must be stopped. And it's quite clear that the object is to stop the investigation. After forswearing personal attacks on you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for the better part of 20 minutes, the ranking member uh, then proceeded to violate every norm of decorum and decency that exists in the House of Representatives among members of Congress and between the chairman and the ranking member of our standing committees, uh, norms that are meant to preserve the dignity of this committee, of the Congress, uh, and uh, to preserve the confidence of the American people in their government. I think such conversation uh, about uh, fellow members diminishes uh, those uh, who make the comments and diminish this committee. Uh, I would, uh, on the very subject uh, that the ranking member raised, uh, uh, rise to the chairman's defense uh, in a way that the chairman chose not to do, although he certainly under the rules of the House would be entitled to do so as a point of personal privilege. Uh, and I will uh, make the chairman's defense by referring to today's Washington Post. One need not look very far. Uh, the column by Mary McGrory, uh, who is uh, typically a defender of Democrat priorities in the Washington Post. 
Uh, and I note, uh, by the way, that the chairman was criticized. Uh, uh, the word used by the ranking member was reprehensible. Reprehensible is uh, essentially a five-syllable word for scumbag. Uh, plain speaking here apparently is the offense. Uh, by being a plain speaking Midwesterner uh, and refusing to dissemble, Mr. Chairman, uh, you are uh, not apparently playing by the rules. You are not an unusually good liar, to use uh, Senator Kerry's uh, description of Bill Clinton. Apparently it is acceptable for the Democratic uh, Senatorial Committee uh, chairman to say this, but it is not appropriate for you, uh, Mr. Chairman, to hold such opinions. Uh, in today's Washington Post column, Mary McGrory had to say uh, the following things about Bill Clinton. He has left Hollywood in his dust. The fantasy machine could never have devised, or if it had, never dared film the scenario that Clinton has lived in the last three months, which has been a pageant of salacious doings in hallowed settings. Salacious is another one of those multi-syllabic words that protects people in polite society. Uh, second, Clinton's melodramatic 60 Minutes TV appearance with Hillary by his side uh, was one in which he admitted he had caused pain in his marriage without ever saying just how. He denied having a 12-year affair with Jennifer Flowers. At a deposition in the Paula Jones case, the president admitted having sex with Flowers, but only once. His spinners say there was no contradiction between the denial and the admission. Uh, she goes on to say, the Clinton blueprint is how to end up with a 69% approval rating after a three-month bout of indecent headlines and titillating detail about a never-explained carry-on with a 21-year-old in and around the Oval Office. She goes on to say, Clinton came in with a reputation for being a philanderer and a liar. His campaign only intensified the reputation. He is ethically handicapped, she says. He was, as he dodged and ducked questions that voters of years past would have insisted on having answers to, further hobbled by fundraising scandals that were as squalid as the reputed dalliances. He's strictly one of a kind, our first president to be strengthened by charges of immorality, says Mary McGrory in today's Washington Post. Mr. Waxman will defend to the death Bill Clinton's right to have sex with Jennifer Flowers and lie about it, to take illegal foreign contributions and cover it up, to claim executive privilege concerning his affair with Monica Lewinsky. But he would deny, Mr. Chairman, your right to hold opinions about those things. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Heels back his time. Uh, Chairman. Mr. Who's next? Mr. Majors? Owens. Major Owens. I'm sorry, Major Owens. I keep calling you a major. Point Thank of you. information, Mr. Chairman. What's that? Chairman. Point of information. Uh, point of information? Do you have a parliamentary inquiry? No, I don't. Well, well then we'll recognize Mr. Owens. Mr. Owens. Mr. Chairman, the dialogue that we've just heard shows that we are dropping to lower depths at a more rapid rate. Uh, I think a motion to assign this investigation to some other committee would be very much in order. We are embarrassing the American people and we are spending their money in the process. These micro arguments concerning petty issues and micro procedures may be interesting to the lawyers, but really we are going nowhere with it. There's been a discussion of money, whether we've spent $2 million or spent $6 million. I think you would agree if you only spent $2 million up to now, the rate we're going, we're going to be spending close to $6 million or maybe $10 million before it's all over. For what purpose? These proceedings have no credibility. The editorials and the leading papers are echoing what the American people feel and certainly what everybody here in Washington knows. But these proceedings have no credibility. They're an embarrassment. They're a joke. What will we do with them when you complete them? considering the fact that they've already been labeled incredible, non-credible. Points of order have been raised about numerous issues here, and one speaker has just used the term that he was molested. Uh, I, I hope that the children of America are not watching this, that there's some way to block this, uh, that they're not watching uh, grown men and women elected by the voters to carry out very responsible duties behaving in this way. $10 million 
that we're going to waste here could buy a great deal of, of useful programs out there. You could, you could build a school for $10 million. You know, the president's program to the school construction is being opposed. It's going to cost too much. We're going to waste $10 million that could build an elementary school even in New York City where the costs are rather high. Uh, the one redeeming feature that this investigation might have had relates to the fact that it's a discussion of the evils of soft money and the billions of millions of dollars that were poured into the last campaign with respect to soft money. That is an evil that we should be addressing. That is an evil that we need to do away with. But we have muddied the waters there, and we refuse to have a, an objective discussion uh, of that. Or even if we're going to have a partisan dis objection, uh, uh, discussion and only focus on Democrats, it's been done in such a manner that's so obviously partisan and so obviously uh, out of the range of the, the stated purposes of the committee just had a discussion on, on the sex life of, of the president, quoting somebody who said that this is a, his, his, his behavior and the kinds of things that are being said about him are uh, uh, unprecedented in American history. You know, well, Thomas Jefferson was called some, some ter pretty terrible names, too. If, if, you don't, if you don't know, just go back and look, look at history, uh, what he was accused of and how the press handled that. And, uh, of what significance is it, uh, is it really in terms of performance? If you compare Thomas Jefferson's performance after the accusations were made against him in his first term, uh, he went on to become one of our greatest presidents. So of what significance are, are, are all these uh, charges? It is significant that at this point in the life of the republic, uh, money is playing such a great role. And we could have a serious discussion of that, maybe if we transfer this committee's investigation of some other committee. This, is, this committee has soiled it. Uh, uh, a set of personnel here, members and staff, have ruined it. Uh, I, I think we owe it to the American people to give them a more serious investigation of a very serious matter. Uh, it does not matter what we do here anymore. It does not matter what we say. We can debate the fine points, the micro uh, matters, the details, or we can talk about bigger issues. This committee is defunct at this point. We're going nowhere. Whatever we come out with, whatever your final report is, whatever the conclusions are, they will have no credibility, no usefulness. Uh, it will just be one more example of indulgence of egos, indulgence of uh, power, abuse of power, and uh, avoidance of the real issues. <laughs> we are not going to help the situation with respect to the cause and the crusade necessary for campaign finance reform. We should talk about the fact that large amounts of money are infused into campaigns, distorting the issues because you use the money to buy television time. We could easily correct that following certain European uh, countries' examples and have television time being made available free. We could, we could do a number of things that we ought to be discussing with the American people and leveling with them that there are some answers to these problems. Instead of seeking the real answers, we propose, we, we uh, uh, satisfy to play in the mud, to play in the feces, uh, and to discredit our own processes, to dis disregard our own rules, and to keep falling lower and lower. I, I, I move, I, 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 don't, I don't think formal motion is in order at this point. We have a matter on the floor. I, I think it would be very much in order for us to consider having this investigation reassigned to some other committee. We should be noble enough to give it up ourselves. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Hastert. I thank the chairman. Uh, I appreciate the comments of the previous gentleman. I know in his other life, uh, he was a librarian, and uh, one of the jobs was to lay out wisdom and truth and knowledge as it was written, also to keep order in the library. Uh, my previous profession, many years ago, getting more and more years ago, was a teacher. I taught economics, I taught history, I taught government. And sometimes in that job you had to keep study hall or uh, take care of the uh, cafeteria during lunch hour. And when there were the greatest mischief that was at hand to cover that mischief, the next thing you knew there would be a food fight if you weren't very vigilant. And that covers a lot of things because that mischief can go on and if you have a food fight going on, 
you're, you know, everything is obfuscated. Well, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I know that this 60 minutes is set aside to discuss the whole issue of immunity. I've seen very little discussion of whether immunity should be granted or not. Instead, we've seen a food fight to, to overshadow which mischief, I'm not sure. But I think this committee has the responsibility of the rules of the House, of the intent of the House, to get to the bottom of illegal acts, if there were illegal acts done, in campaigns in the executive branch. And certainly, uh, this whole discussion has been obfuscated about who called whom who, who uh, made accusations about somebody else. And, you know, it's downright childish. We need to raise above this childish act. We need to go f and move forward with the business of this committee. And sure, we can say that uh, we can point fingers and say, well, this committee can't act anymore. Uh, maybe another committee ought to do this. Sure be easy. We'll start from ground zero. Uh, it's not going to work. This committee needs to get down to business. We need to quit calling each other names. We need to quit obfuscating the issues. And uh, we need to do the work that the House has assigned us. Now, I think that would be uh, a logical thing to do. I think it would be a practical thing to do. And probably most of all, that's what the taxpayers of this country expect us to do. I'm not going to say any more about this issue. I expect us to go forward. I yield my time to the gentleman from Texas. Uh, thank you. I thank the gentleman from uh, Illinois. Uh, Mr. Chairman, as I sit through this, and I'm but a freshman, but have sat through this now for a year and a half, I constantly try and remind all of us, not just those on the other side, that the facts of the case are what should lead us to the truth. And the facts of the case are that continually it's not a committee that will work together to attempting to find the truth. And I go back to the days of Watergate when I began watching politics on TV when a member of the president's own party during the Watergate hearing was the one to lead the way to find out about illegalities and unconstitutional behavior that existed in the White House. That is bipartisanship when both sides are equally appear, uh, trying to get at what the truth is. I have yet to hear one of my colleagues on the other side, whether in this committee or in this House, to ask the questions that Senator Howard Baker asked that I think would be applicable and fair to every single witness. When Senator Baker asked, what did you know and when did you know it? I believe that there is a model that is laid out in our past. And that past is, is that we should let the facts lead us directly to the truth. I am stunned and quite honestly disappointed that this committee today on a partisan basis is trying to determine about whether we want to even get to the truth. Where the other side today openly is admitting they do not want to know even whether we would give immunity to find out what these facts would be so that we hurt no one, no one of these witnesses. Lastly, I will say this. Mr. Waxman, in his opening statement, referred to unnamed Republicans talking about this committee. Among other things, the words unprofessional and a joke and disgusting were used about this committee. I might well, Mr. Chairman, be that unnamed person in describing that, but in no way was I describing the majority. I was in reference to the conduct of the minority, disgusting, unprofessional, and a joke. Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Uh, who seeks time on your side? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Fatah. 
Thank you very much. It is instructive to see uh, all of the, uh, the name calling that's been going on. Um, and the previous speaker um, threw out a few more and directed it at the minority. Uh, and I know that the chairman is a, an avid golfer. You, you can't get a lower golf score by calling people's names. Uh, whether you call the president a scumbag or rather, as my good friend from California did, take a newspaper column and read it into the record. We could take newspaper columns of what people have said about the Speaker of the House or the chairman of this committee. We could pick Republicans out and do that kind of, uh, of work. I don't think it's becoming of the committee. And what we really need to try to figure out is where are we going to go from here the gentleman who just previously spoke was the one who made the motion to gag this debate um, and to create a circumstance in which the minority could not fully express itself on this, what the majority wants to suggest is a very important matter of whether we're going to grant immunity. There's a wall full of pictures on that side of the aisle, but over here we have nothing. We don't have anything on pursuing the chairman's commitment to investigate the triad management. We have nothing in terms of pursuing Haley Barber in terms of the National Policy Forum and his trip to a foreign land uh, to ask for and receive millions of dollars that were then funneled into congressional campaigns of the majority. This desire to seek out illegality seems to lose its enthusiasm when it's directed at the majority party. And so when you see the Democrats on this committee be less than um, enthusiastic about cooperating, it's because we don't see any effort to be even-handed, even though uh, I've heard the chairman and, and I believe that he has some desire in that direction. It's just not been evident in the work of the staff and in the work of the committee thus far. So there probably won't be support for this motion today. And I think that we all have to, at some point, move past the name calling and understand why that may be. And we can refer this investigation out to another committee. There's a committee in the House that has some time available. They just spent a lot of money investigating the Dornan Sanchez race and wasting money on that. Maybe they could take up this matter now uh, and explore it, uh, because obviously they have some expertise that could be utilized. I want to thank the uh, chairman for the time, and I'd be glad to yield uh, to any of my colleagues who want or desire time. I yield to the gentleman from New York. You know, I've listened to the debate about name calling and of course um, I'm troubled by it as well. But you know, you would act as if the name calling is on the minority side and not on the majority side. I think that the majority side is doing a lot of name calling starting with the chairman who is the biggest name call of all. You know, he used the word scumbag. That's, that's a big name caller. Uh, and then, of course, uh, you talk about a bipartisan effort. Now, if you have 75% of the staff, and we have 25% of the staff, and then when I count the amount of members that are on the committee, and then if you want a bipartisan effort, how do you have 75% of the staff and give us 25% of the staff and say that this is something that we're looking at together, we're working together to try and Prove in terms of uh, uh, the quality, in terms of what's happening, in terms of campaign reform. Once we do it this way, we have information. But to me, right within itself, the fact that you have 75% and you give us 25% indicate the fact that you don't want to be fair. I mean, that within itself says that. And of course, in terms of the kind of comments that are being made on the other side, also points out that you know, uh, you're know you not really interested you know, in getting to the real truth. You're, you're actually trying to create ways and methods to try and embarrass without bringing about any solution. I think someone said it and said it so well that we have no credibility. And I've said this early on, you know, uh, that this committee has lost it. We blew it. And I think that we would be smart now to work out another kind of arrangement where we could really go and look at some things that need to be looked at because this committee has no credibility, Mr. Chairman, and you need to just recognize it. You need to understand that. You know, and, uh, and, and just say that we're not going to waste $10 million. We're going to use this money to buy books for children. Uh, to make, we're going to use this money to buy computers for children. We're going to use this money that's going to, in a way, that's going to make some sense. And I, that's basically, you know, uh, my views and my feelings. And not only that, I think that now we are wasting a lot of time. I think members are now wasting time. And I think that that's, 
something that we cannot afford the luxury of. So I want to let you know, Mr. Chairman, that uh, uh, you need to take another look at what you're doing, where you're going, and how you're going. I think that's uh, uh, something that needs to be considered, and that to sit around and to read stuff into the records, to just sort of uh, uh, blow up a record, you know, uh, to me is, is, is not the way to go at this problem. If the gentleman uh, who has a second or two more would yeah, yield, yeah. the last time we voted in this committee where our votes counted was for immunity for Mr. Wong, and we all voted for it. So the Democrats tried to cooperate with this investigation, and we've just gotten the back of uh, the hand from the Republicans. They're not interested in working with us, and now they're out to try to embarrass us because we're not willing to give them that same benefit of the doubt again. I, I agree with the gentleman very, very much, and, and it's a shame. And I would hope, Mr. Chairman, you realize what you're doing. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Horn, and Mr. Horn, could you yield 15 seconds to me? Uh, certainly. Just 15 seconds. First of all, regarding Tan Siang, we have involved uh, ourselves in depositions of Republicans and Democrats. Regarding Ted Siong, Republicans and Democrats, and I would like to quote a, fa a famous American regarding the last statement by my colleague, Yogi Berra, when he said, it ain't over till it's over. Mr. Horn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, what I wanted to pursue was straightening out the truth on the subpoenas and a few other things. We've had nearly 100 different witnesses to deal with, and as you noted, they've taken the fifth or fled the country, many of them. And this has necessitated a very large number of subpoenas. Now, of the 606 subpoenas issued by this committee, 480, or 80 percent of them, were related to a very small number of key figures and their associates. In fact, related to about seven different witnesses. Let me give you an example. Charlie Tree, that we've all talked about and all the rest of it, 117 subpoenas directed at him. That's 19.3 percent of the 80 percent. John Wong, Mokhtar Riyadi, 57 subpoenas, 9.4 percent. Ted Shion, that you mentioned, 59 subpoenas, 9.7 percent. Webster Hubble, 42 subpoenas, 7 percent. Johnny Chung, 32, 5.3 percent. Mark Middleton, 33. 5.4 percent. Then Nora and Jean Lum and Associates, 104 percent, 17.1. And then subpoenas including all of the above, beyond that, 36 subpoenas went in their direction, and that's 6 percent. And then we, of course, had about 170 subpoenas to banks, 98 to phone companies, 24 to hotels and travel agencies. But the gentleman so, yield just for a second so much, for a question. Yes. Be delighted. Uh, on the uh, uh, hotels and banks and phone companies, are they Republican or Democrat? Who knows? Okay, thank we're, you. We're trying to find out so what it is. We can't say all this stuff goes to, to Democrat entities. Absolutely not. Thank you. Absolutely. Some of these people we do know gave to Republicans as well as Democrats. We looked at the Florida situation, for example. But now let's get to the matter at hand. The simple conclusion one would make, I would think, that is looking at this and using some common sense is, if you do not grant the immunity, you simply don't want to know the truth. It's as simple as that. And I've said many times, before I ever came to Congress, I watched the HUD hearings of this subcommittee when Tom Lantos did a fine job chairing it, and Chris Shays, the ranking Republican, did a fine job, job there. I've seen none of you that have acted like Chris Shays on the other side of this aisle. And I wish you had. Chris Shays was after the truth of a Republican administration. I haven't seen any backing to be after the truth about a Democratic administration. Now, I don't care if they're Democrat or Republican. If I'm here in the majority on the Republican and there's a Republican president, I will go after the truth there. I won't play the White House game of covering it up. Now, I'm sure people have read European history. They know Mr. Goebbels said, if you lie enough, or if you say, well, they're doing nothing, eventually the people will believe it. Uh, I think Americans have more common sense than that, but certainly we saw an example of that in the 30s and the 40s. Going back to the St. Clair expedition that I've mentioned before here in 1792, the prerogative of the Congress to get the facts is very clear and consistent for over 200 years but it takes people that are willing to want the facts. Now, the comment that the committee is defunct and going nowhere 
is just the White House spin and the propaganda aspects that we know. Millions of dollars of illegal campaign contributions were made in 1996. We don't know all the people they went to because we haven't been able to get at all of the truth. It's like the mafia. They hold hands and they swear an oath and they look us right in the eye, many of them, and say, hey, we don't know anything. We can't recollect it. I've been through this on Filegate. I've been through this on Travelgate. I'm not naive. Now, the fact is, that the lawyers on the payroll in the White House, the PR experts, that's what the spin is. Again, if you don't vote for immunity, it means you simply don't want to know the truth and you're covering up for when you shouldn't be covering up if you're going to be a true member of Congress. Chairman Neal? I certainly will to the, my colleague. Uh, I just want to underscore uh, uh, one point, and, th and that is that uh, the United States Department of Justice has told us they have no objection granting immunity to any of these people. They are the people who would prosecute if anybody's going to prosecute. There will be no prosecutions. Therefore, giving this immunity to which the Department of Justice has not objected is not controversial. Standing in the way of these grants of immunity, however, is a clear and obvious choice to obstruct this investigation. Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, yield back the balance of his time. Thank you, gentlemen. Yield back the balance of his time. Uh, is Mr. Wise. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As um, one who was here for the HUD hearings and one who actually sat on that subcommittee, I appreciate the gentleman's reference and Mr. Shays was exemplary. I think what needed to be pointed out is a difference in those hearings because Mr. Shays and Mr. Lantos worked out clearly in advance uh, any subpoenas and major uh, uh, witnesses that were going to be called, just as when I had the privilege of chairing a, a subcommittee on this, uh, on this committee. Uh, my, my ranking member then, Mr. McCandless, and I worked together, and I would not have issued a subpoena. In fact, uh, would not, we did not move forward into areas where we did not work on it together and agree on it together because we knew that to have any credibility in our findings, and this was in the very uh, delicate issue sometimes of the overseeing the war on drugs, in order to have any credibility, we had to do it together. That's not been the case here. I'm astounded at the unprecedented use of the subpoena power, the unprecedented calling of witnesses, the unprecedented depositions uh, that this chairman and this Rep Republican majority has exercised in this committee. So this is not, regrettably, uh, the same committee and the same spirit on this committee that conducted those HUD hearings and conducted so many others that were crucial. Some have talked about co conversations and, and whether they diminish the committee. The reality is it's not conversations and it's not name calling that diminishes this committee. It's the actions of the committee that diminish the committee. That's what caused us committee to be in the low regard that it is. Mr. Chairman, I don't care what your personal thoughts are, thoughts are concerning the President, just as we, everyone has personal thoughts about people. What I care about are the motivations, though, that go into the actions of the committee, and those, I think, are very, very instructive. The reality is that there are, several, there are serious allegations by both, about both Republicans and Democrats in the campaign finance, and those allegations involve hundreds of millions of dollars that both parties raised. And yet, why is it then that I see a 1,000 requests, over 1,000 requests for information going to Democratic targets, and I see something like 12 going to Republican targets? Mr. Chairman, the reality is that whatever was done in soft money, which ought to be eliminated, we can take care of that tomorrow. But it, regrettably, it has been the Republican leadership that stopped the campaign finance bill from coming to the floor two weeks ago that can do away with and, and eliminate the need to be concerned our, concerning ourselves with soft money. The good news is that that leadership has now said it will bring a bill to the floor, although we'll see in what form. But campaign finance reform can obviate and remove the need for a lot of this immediately, and that's dealing away with soft money. I'm greatly concerned with the area of private telephone conversations being, being released. Yes, it's true. When made, Mr. Hubble was incarcerated, and there may have been a notice that said your t conversation is being taped. They were being taped for the security needs of a, of a, uh, of a penal institution. They weren't being taped so that as, as someone talks to their 
spouse, talks to their children, expresses their most innermost thoughts, personal thoughts to them, that it could be strewn across the public record, particularly by a member of Congress. It's one thing to have the Department of Justice with its protocols and procedures in place. It's something else to have a federal judge that may have to rule upon whether you can release it. But to know that a member of Congress can, at their will, whomever they are, turn these things loose, whether directly or perhaps by leaking them, that's astounding, and I don't think most of the American people think that's playing fair. Taxpayers ought to be concerned about these hearings. Millions of dollars being spent. Millions of dollars giving immunity, which, if we play this thing like the Keystone Cops that this committee has been playing it like, can result eventually in some people walking who probably should have been prosecuted and possibly jailed. Taxpayers ought to be concerned anytime they look up on a wall and they see the wall of shame with a bunch of pictures. Well, that's not serious prosecution. That's not serious investigation. I see those same kind of, when I walk into my children's uh, uh, grade school, I see those kinds of things up on the wall in terms of walls and blocks and things like that. We, we've got to be concerned about facts, and we have to be concerned about serious investigation. Serious investigation means bipartisan investigation. It means people working together and being consulted and having a concerted effort. Somebody referred to the Watergate hearings. I agree with you. Sam Irvin and, and Howard Baker d conducted themselves well. I never heard of Sam Irvin suggesting that there would be this kind of unprecedented subpoena power given to this chairman or any chairman, uh, uh, as, as has been the case. So this has to be a serious effort to have credibility. And finally, I'm concerned about precedents for the future, because what we're about here today, it's in some ways it's, it's um, sad, in some ways it's unprofessional, but basically it affects the rights of human beings and American citizens far beyond the people being brought here today. That's what we ought to be concerned about, Mr. Chairman, and that's why we ought to move this thing along to, uh, to other investigating bodies. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Souter. It seems we often forget what we're talking about here. Our committee has oversight jurisdiction over the executive branch, and members who don't understand that maybe should be on a different committee because that is what we are assigned to do. What we have been investigating is corruption at the very core of our elected government. We don't know the extent of it, and that's the process of these hearings. This isn't about Monica Lewinsky. It's not about Jennifer Flowers. It's not about Paula Jones or Kathleen Willey. It's about whether there has been an abuse of power, whether there has been payoffs at high levels from foreign governments and channeled money. And that is what we are trying to investigate here. We have the obligation to do that. We have the obligation not to conclude guilt or innocence until we get into this. We heard in the opening statement of the ranking minority member an attempt to take this investigation into, in my opinion, today, an attack on our chairman and my friend from Indiana. He made the statement that he was vile. According to the dictionary, his behavior was vile. According to the dictionary, vile means, and this is what he in effect said our chairman was, morally base or evil, wicked, depraved, sinful, repulsive, disgusting is the second definition, the third is cheap, worthless, the fourth is degrading, low, and mean. Now apparently he wants to make a distinction without a difference, where he said that he was talking about his behavior, not the person. Apparently to the ranking member, that he feels that if our chairman had said that the president's behavior was that of a scumbag, it would have been okay. This is a distinction without a difference and to attack our chairman for doing the very thing that they've been doing to him all the way along. And when the ranking member had said of our previous chairman that his uh, hearings were, he, had, he declared he had contempt for the chairman, and I was here when he said that for Chairman Klinger, I find it disingenuous because what we have seen, in my opinion, is a pattern. Uh, Mr. Waxman has occasionally voted with the minority, but basically he has attacked every investigation we've tried to do. He is a very articulate gentleman. He has uh, been a longtime advocate for uh, liberal causes, and I very much respect him, quite frankly, at a personal level, even though we disagree. But I think it's unfortunate that he seems in many cases here to be working more like a defense attorney for the administration. We have had everything we've tried to do in this committee related to this administration uh, opposed. Uh, and now I think this kind of, we've had it with Craig Livingston, we've had it with the travel office, we've had it with the, the files, we've had it uh, regarding statements uh, that on their final travel gate report. And I, I want to read something into the record because I think it's important. 
Mr. 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 Suda, would you yield for one second? I'll give it right back to you, okay. sir, for 15 seconds. I just caution members of the Family Values Party and those of us on the Democratic side. We've had new members of the audience join us. Let us please uh, reserve some of the comments I've heard from some of my colleagues on that side. At least show them the respect that they deserve and those I'm who escort them in the room. I, I, I yield back the time, and I thank you, my I, friend from Indiana. I respect that. I have said nothing that I wouldn't uh, say. I believe that it's important to put into the record and will not be... Uh, I don't think the gentleman was trying to intimidate me, but I think everything that I said was correct. In the book, The Spin Cycle, in the book, The Spin Cycle, and this is what we're concerned of. It goes both directions, just like they're concerned that we may have concluded and made a judgment. We have the same conclusion. On page 198, Lanny Davis volunteered to appear on this week, he, uh, which had already booked Dan Burton. He said, but perhaps it would be better to send Henry Waxman, the California congressman who is a senior Democrat in Burton's investigating committee. Waxman would seem less defensive than an administrative lawyer administration lawyer. Emanuel was mulling it over when Davis walked in with the Burton letter demanding that Charles Ruff appear before his panel to explain the White House's refusal to provide subpoenaed documents or face a contempt of Congress citation. Quote, I don't know whether I'm on or not, Davis said of the show. Quote, my view is let's pull you, Emanuel said. We've got Henry. Quote, Henry's good, Davis said. Now, it isn't clear in this, quite frankly, whether Mr. Waxman knew this or not. The question is, is he being used by the administration? Are our colleagues being used by the administration to help uh, obstruct justice? We cannot prove whether or not this committee has been wasting its time. If nobody will talk to us, we can establish A, we can establish C, we can establish E, we can establish M. But to convict somebody, you have to have some proof. To have some proof, we have to have some immunity because apparently these people are willing to flee the country, plead the fifth, rather than do the service to America, come forth and tell us because they're worried that somebody is going to go after them individually. The Justice Department has signed off with this immunity. If the Justice Department says it doesn't threaten other investigations, the least we can do, well, the gentleman if, if our job him. is to try to pursue this, is to go forth with this immunity. And I, I want to make it clear, and I, I want to say this again that I don't want to see the gentleman from California turned in to an Earl Landgreen uh, of Indiana uh, who, who just does these things. I believe your personal integrity has been high. I've worked with you as a staffer and a member at the personal the level. Yield? But I am concerned about uh, the process, and I will yield. Uh, when, uh, time I have a just to give you an example of the way we look at things, the chairman said he's doing an investigation of Ted Seung, and he's looking at Republicans as well, one of the Republicans involved in a Ed Seung contribution is uh, Matt Fong, who's a Republican. Well, the committee's uh, uh, newspaper uh, report, uh, newspaper spokesman said, uh, since Fong never knowingly accepted illegal contributions, and he's been forthcoming with the investigators, we don't think he's done anything wrong. Well, he's exonerating a man who's a Republican, but he doesn't make that statement about anybody else. It's, it's, you, you assume Rec that a Democrat is knowingly Rec wrong, but a Republican is always my right. Time. Reclaiming my time, the point I want to make here is our oversight investigation is of the administration, and I don't believe we should exonerate either side, and in the end, I don't believe we will, but our focus has to be directly on the administration. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, who's next on your side? Ms. Norton? Ms. Norton? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. Maloney, uh, did you seek time? Ms. Maloney, you're recognized for five minutes. Your mic's not on. If my uh, daughter had called anyone what Mr. Burton called the President of the United States, I would have washed her mouth out with soap. I'm not suggesting that we take such a, an action against the chairman now, but I, I, I do believe that he should be disciplined in some way. I, I think that the name calling is an illustration of how partisan this committee has become, that it's reduced to cheap name calling. I believe that the the, the graph here that the, chair, the ranking member prepared speaks for itself in how partisan it has become. This one illustrates uh, information requests, but I'd like to uh, mention also that 1,037, that's 99 percent <coughs> of the um, information re requests were, were, were issued to investigate allegations of Democratic fundraising abuses. Only 12 were issued to investigate Republican fundraising abuses. 
532 subpoenas were issued to investigate Democrats, nine for Republicans. 144 depositions were, it, were given to investigate Democrats, two depositions for Republicans. Democrats have been forced to turn over 1.5 million pages of documents in response to subpoenas. And if that were not enough, the chairman has now started releasing to the general public personal private phone conversation that has absolutely nothing to do with campaign finance investigations. And uh, again, I implore both uh, the Republicans and the Democrats to turn uh, their focus to some hearings on campaign finance bills that will be considered on the floor now that the discharge position, dis, the, the, dis, the discharge petition, the, the, uh, the majority has uh, surrendered and now uh, to the American people and said that we can have a full uh, debate on campaign finance on the floor of Congress. We should start working in this committee, getting ready for the scheduled uh, debate at the end of May. And uh, I just uh, would like to now turn over to my colleague uh, from the District of Columbia the remaining time that I have. Thank you. I, I appreciate the gentlewoman for yielding. And I, I, I want to speak very quickly. And I want to protest that, that many members will be unable to speak. And I want to give my five minutes and hope it will be divided among the members who remain. I came here this morning to vote for immunity. I did not come here to have my, my reputation impugned and accused of a cover-up. I, uh, I regret and protest that I have been forced to vote against uh, immunity uh, in order to protest rank unfairness in this committee. I have been driven, as have every member on my side been driven, to vote against what they wanted to vote for. Uh, we have forgotten that essentially where we began was an investigation into campaign finance reform. In this morning's uh, roll call, it is reported uh, and I quote, sensing they were about to lose a battle on campaign finance reform, the House GOP leadership caved in and agreed to hold an open debate by the end of May. We have lost sight of the point of these hearings while the matter is going to the floor. All we have to show for it is a board up there about Democrats, almost nothing about Republicans, as if the only people who were raising money the last time were a bunch of Democrats who raised far less money than the Republicans, who all went out and raised it perfectly legitimately, uh, uh, given what we've, we've come to understand by these hearings. Uh, the fact is that these proceedings have been reduced to an analysis of name calling, uh, now we're on to what I'm sure the majority re re regards as an innovative procedure. We can't do our job. Therefore, we're going to give it to another committee uh, to decide who shall be immune or not. That is not an innovation, my friends. That is a failure. What this committee needs to do is to see whether it can, in the few remaining weeks of this session, recoup its re reputation. Uh, uh, find an accommodation of fairness with the minority so that we will have something to show at the end of this session for the work of this committee. I yield back the balance of my time. I, I, I yield the balance of my time to the next member. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you Mr. Davis, much, Mr. Chairman. you have the rest of the time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I certainly want to thank the gentlelady for yielding. You know, I've been told that after all is said and done, most of the time more is said than done. And, and, and I think that's what's happening with these proceedings and this hearing. I mean, we've been dancing around the issues, skirting the truth, seeking one-upsmanship, looking for advantage. Mr. Davis, your time has expired. Mr. Shaddy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I have to sincerely apologize. I obviously got the wrong notice for this hearing because the hearing notice I got said we were to debate resolutions granting congressional immunity to Irene Wu, Nancy Lee, Larry Wong, and Kent Law. Um, and in this discussion, all I've heard is a full-blown debate of name-calling. Um, clearly, I missed the notice. There must have been a different notice that said we were going to debate the committee's effectiveness today and debate name-calling. Um, I have to tell you, Mr. Chairman, I really prepared rather not to debate the issue of name-calling or the effectiveness of the hearing or why everybody's upset, but to debate the issue of 
congressional immunity for Irene Wu, Nancy Lee, Larry Wong, and Kent Law. So if it's all right, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to discuss that issue. Um, Irene Wu was Johnny Chung's office manager and primary assistant at uh, Assi Automated Systems Intelligence Incorporated. Wu distributed reimbursements for, for conduit payments to the Clinton Gore 96 campaign. She's already been immunized by the Department of Justice, and the Department of Justice does not oppose granting congressional immunity to Irene Wu. I know of no reason why uh, we would not grant immunity to Irene Wu. The second witness, Nancy Lee, uh, has an alias. She is also name, known as Nay Chi Lee. She was an engineer at AISI. Uh, numerous witnesses we've interviewed uh, by a committee have said that Nancy Lee solicited contributions to Clinton Gore in 1996 from her colleagues and then reimbursed those colleagues for the contributions, essentially a money laundering scheme. Uh, she also has been immunized by the Department of Justice and has testified before a grand jury. Uh, the conduit payments by, to the Clinton-Gore campaign were among those that the charges to which Chung recently pleaded to, uh, guilty. Again, the Department of Justice, the appropriate investigating agency, again does not oppose our granting congressional immunity uh, to Nancy Lee. Uh, we have a letter from them to that effect. So I know of no reason why we wouldn't grant immunity uh, to Nancy Lee. The third witness, Larry Wong, uh, has pled guilty in 1997, May of 1997, to felonies regarding illegal campaign contributions. He has been a close friend of Nora and Jean Lum since their days in Hawaii and is believed to have relevant information regarding the conduit contributions made by the Lums and others in the 1992 fundraising by John Wong and James Riotti and the formation of the Asian Pacific Advisory Council uh, and the DNC sponsorship of APAC. Um, a number of our witnesses have told us that Larry Wong had close contact with the Lums and should have knowledge of how they made these political contributions. Wong arranged several fundraisers for APAC, uh, and following the 1992 election, Nora Lum placed Larry Wong on the board of directors at Dynamic Energy Resources Incom Incorporated, the company through which the Lums made a number of their conduit contributions in the 1994 campaign cycle. Wong and his wife were conduit contributors using money given to them from Dynamic Energy checking account. Uh, again, the Department of Justice has written us saying they do not object to the granting by this committee of immunity to Larry Wong. I know of no reason why we wouldn't grant immunity to Larry Wong. The last gentleman is Kent Law. Uh, Kent Law appears to know the most about Mr. Siong of anybody. Uh, it is, in fact, likely that he knows more than anyone who has spoken to us. Uh, Kent Law, uh, about which we're debating granting immunity, uh, is in the cigarette business together with Mr. Siong. Uh, Mr. Siong manufactures cigarettes, Hong Ta Shan cigarettes, in China, Cambodia, Singapore, and Latin America. And Kent Law distributes those same Hong Ta Shan cigarettes in the United States. Together, the two of them formed the Pro PRC Alliance of Chinese American Groups and installed Kent Law as the president of that company. They have traveled extensively together and have attended social functions together. Kent Law was Siong's guest at the DNC Century fundraiser in July 1996. Law's company contributed $50,000 to the Democratic National Committee. The DNC documents indicate that Law's contribution was solicited by John Wong, who solicited all of the Siong family's contribution. And again, the, this is the fourth witness, the Department of Justice has given us a letter indicating they do not object to the granting of immunity to these witnesses. I know we've had a lot of discussion here today, but it is clear to me that each of these witnesses has substantive, significant information which could help us in our investigation, and that the fact that the Department of Justice, the Clinton-Gore Department of Justice, the administration's Department of Justice, which would be responsible for prosecuting any crimes that we discover, has no objection. I repeat, no objection to our granting immunity to any of these witnesses. I am mystified why it has taken this long to debate this issue. Uh, and so uh, I certainly think we should Governor proceed, you. and I certainly think that uh, we should grant immunity to all four witnesses, and I'd be happy to yield uh, 
The balance of my time to Mr. Davis. Uh, I thank the gentleman. You know, it's interesting. If, if Kent Law were distributing, uh, uh, instead of Chinese cigarettes and giving to Democrats, if he were making American uh, cigarettes, uh, the uh, minority would be all over him, trying to get him, giving him immunity and going after him and those kind of issues. I, I feel almost embarrassed to be part of the debate we've had over the I feel like taking a shower when I'm through. We have not addressed the issue of granting these uh, individuals immunity here today, which the Justice Department doesn't object to. And I think the members on the other side have to ask themselves, are they going to address the issue before this committee, which is giving, the ish giving these people immunity so we can move ahead with the investigation, or are they going to con con uh, continue to obfuscate in the roadblocks uh, that, that move ahead? So I think the issue is pretty clear, and trying to use other issues is, is uh, 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 to me, moving this uh, Congress in the wrong direction. Time has expired. Uh, Mr. Towns. Right. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Let me just say, first of all, that the Justice Department has already given some of these uh, people immunity. Uh, they've given it to Wu, they've given it to Lee, so that's been done already. So uh, I don't think we need to spend a lot of time talking about that. But let me yield uh, time to Mr. Kanjorski, gentleman from Pennsylvania. Mr. Chairman, uh, you had offered uh, a unanimous consent request to put documents from the Justice Department in the record. And one of those letters dated April 22nd spells out a protocol of seven elements in which uh, uh, the understanding of admitting uh, uh, or taking a testimony and holding that testimony in confidence. It is my understanding that uh, the majority uh, uh, indicates to the Justice Department that they have full intentions and are fully capable of complying with those seven elements. And my question to you, if that is the case, how is it that the, the request was, uh, for documents was made uh, for the tapes and uh, there was lively discussion as to the privacy of those tapes and then ultimately there was an understanding and a direction sent to the chair of this committee that uh, the uh, respect for the personal privacy interests of Mr. Hubble and other individuals would be held since the Justice Department recognized under the specific s section of the U.S. Code that they were barred from making public disclosure of, of these tapes and that the tapes were only uh, carried out for the protection and the correctional institution of the United States for the safety of the government and the prisoner. But those tapes were finally, by negotiation, released to this committee with the understanding that this committee would uh, protect and follow the conditions that would protect the privacy of the act and the privacy of the government not to disclose these same tapes. And yet, in, in, in spite of that, early today, the chairman took great pride in announcing that he actually asked the two of those tapes to be put in the transcript of this, this record uh, when uh, the ranking member of the committee, Mr. Lantis, was sitting for Mr. Waxman and apparently allowed the, that unanimous request to go by without objecting to it. And then ultimately we see that uh, those uh, transcripts of those tapes appear in the uh, American in, uh, uh, the Spectator and the Wall Street Journal. Why should anyone in this committee, Republican or Democrat, and I particularly address it to my friends on the Republican side, why, why should you have any faith in the staff or the leadership of this committee that uh, the seven conditions to be, uh, to be taken uh, uh, on, on the immunity question will be held in confidence, that those transcripts will be held in confidence when we have had over and over and over again incredible evidence of improper leakage re re released to the uh, media of information that was promised to be held in confidence, that uh, uh, this committee received documentation from the Justice Departments and the Bureau of Corrections that disclosed this committee that at no time did they have an authority to make a public disclosure of these tapes, but they were respecting the power of the uh, uh, subpoena of this committee, of the Congress of the United States, that they would tr give us that trust and faith and that confidentiality. Would the and, gentleman and, yield and, for and No, I'm not going to yield, I'll Mr. Chairman. I'll be glad Chairman. to answer. Well, I'm, I, 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 think, I think the record speaks for itself. So, we've <laughs> been nine months with leaks, uh, a lack of confidentiality, uh, releasing confidential information with the intention of badgering and, and, and suggesting that witnesses uh, will be injured if they don't cooperate in some way or uh, dance to the tune of the majority or the majority staff. I, I, it would be irresponsible, not only for the minority members of this committee, but any of my good friends on the Republican side, that without 
correcting what happened uh, in the past that we grant no immunity, say that we cannot c comply with those seven uh, conditions set forth in the Justice Department's letter until you straighten out the process to do so. I would, yield back would, to Mr. Would the gentleman yeah. yield for an answer? I'll be glad to give no, the gentleman I'm, an answer. Mr. Chairman, I only have a few minutes, and I want to okay. yield to, uh, to Mr. Davis of Illinois, and then, of course, I'm going to try to yield to the gentleman, one, gentleman from Pennsylvania. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, how much time is left? And don't use that on my time. <laughs> Whatever is left on the clock. Well, that guy, I'm asking, where is it? I can't see it. Could you turn it around? About two minutes, one minute. Yeah, okay. I yield to Danny Davis. Thank you very much. And I want to thank the gentleman and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Someone asked the question a moment ago, why would we not vote to grant immunity? And I can think of four reasons. First of all, the motivation is wrong. Secondly, the investigation has been too one-sided, too partisan. And ultimately, it has become too theatrical. I mean, I can agree that the whole world is a stage and everybody play their part. But what we've got is more like a dance, something called the electric slide. And there's a question that the caller asked there that says, how low can you go? Then the answer is go to the floor. And I think we've obviously gone too low. And that's the reason that I'm going to vote against granting immunity. I thank you and yield back to, to Mr. Towns. I yield the balance of my time to the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Fatah. Mr. Fatah. Mr. Chairman, I just want to say that, that I know that there's been some concern about the nature of this debate. Unfortunately, it started with the reading of this column from the Washington Post, which started on the majority side, so that we may have gotten a little off track. It's unfortunate that we want to call the president names, but now we can move on with our, the business at hand. Fired. Gentleman's time has expired. All time has expired. The question is on the immunity resolution offered in block. All those in favor of the resolutions will signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed will signify by saying no. no. Mr. Chairman. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes I have it. I demand a roll call vote. Uh, a roll call vote has been demanded and will be honored. Uh, the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Burton. Aye. Mr. Burton votes aye. Mr. Gilman? Mr. Hastert? Aye. Mr. Hastert votes aye. Mrs. Morella? Mr. Shays? Mr. Shays votes aye. Mr. Cox? Mr. Cox votes aye. Ms. Ross Layton? Aye. Ms. Ross Layton votes aye. Mr. McHugh? <laughs> Mr. McHugh votes aye. Mr. Horn? Mr. Horn votes aye. Mr. Micah? Mr. Davis of Virginia? Mr. Davis of Virginia votes aye. <coughs> Mr. McIntosh? Mr. Souter? Mr. Souter votes aye. Mr. Scarborough? Mr. Shattuck? Mr. Shattuck votes aye. Mr. La Tourette? Mr. La Tourette votes aye. Mr. Sanford? Aye. Mr. Sanford votes aye. Mr. Sununu? Mr. Sessions? Aye. Mr. Sessions votes aye. Mr. Pappas? Mr. Snowbarger? Aye. Mr. Snowbarger votes aye. Mr. Barr? Aye. Mr. Barr votes aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. Mr. Miller votes aye. Mr. Waxman? No. Mr. Waxman votes no. Mr. Lantos? No. Mr. Lantos votes no. Mr. Wise? No. Mr. Wise votes no. Mr. Owens? No. Mr. Owens votes no. Mr. Towns? No. Mr. Towns votes no. Mr. Kanjorski? No. Mr. Kanjorski votes no. 
Mr. Condent? No. Mr. Condent votes no. Mr. Sanders? No. Mr. Sanders votes no. Mrs. Maloney? Mr. Barrett? Mr. Barrett votes no. Ms. Norton? Ms. Norton votes no. Mr. Fatah? Mr. Fatah votes no. Mr. Cummings? Mr. Cummings votes no. Mr. Kucinich? No. Mr. Kucinich votes no. Mr. Bogoyevich? Mr. Bogoyevich votes no. Mr. Davis of Illinois? Mr. Davis from Illinois votes no. Mr. Tierney? Mr. Tierney votes no. Mr. Turner? Mr. Turner votes no. Mr. Allen? Mr. Allen votes no. Mr. Ford? Mr. Ford votes no. Mr. Gilman? Aye. Mr. Gilman votes aye. Mrs. Morella? Mr. Micah? Mr. Micah votes aye. Mr. McIntosh? Aye. Mr. McIntosh votes aye. Mr. Scarborough? Mr. Sununu? Mr. Sununu votes aye. Mr. Pappas? Mr. Pappas votes aye. Mrs. Maloney? The clerk will report the tally. Mr. Chairman, there are 21 ayes and 19 nays. The immunity resolutions are not approved by the statutorily required two-thirds vote on the of the committee's membership. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I uh, move the committee to now adjourn. A motion has been made uh, that the committee do now adjourn. Uh, let me make a quick announcement. Uh, Mr. McIntosh's hearing at this uh, room in this room will start 10 minutes after we adjourn. The question is on the motion to adjourn. All those in favor will signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? The committee stands adjourned.
You're watching C-SPAN, and here's a look at our lineup. Coming up, a Senate hearing on breast cancer research and the drug tamoxifen. After that, remarks by President Clinton on his child care initiative. That's followed by assistant to the president, Sidney Blumenthal, on Mr. Clinton's presidency and America's future. Then Republican Congressman Bob Livingston hosts a town hall meeting in his district. Tonight on Book Notes, 